And so here we are, August 22nd, and I am glad, I'm refreshed, glad to be here. And I would like for you to turn with me to 1 Peter again. I want to continue on there. 1 Peter chapter 1. The last sermon that I spoke on this passage contained verse 3, started with the word blessed, that is, as we discovered, worthy of adoration, God is adorable, worthy of adoration, because He has caused some things to happen in verse 3 there. We see number one. He caused us to be born again. The new birth. We see number two, to a living hope. That is, this hope is in a resurrected Savior, resurrected from the dead, the verse tells us. And so it's a living hope. All other hopes are dead hopes. You hope in your good works. You hope in your baptism. You hope in your your Christian parents, you hope in all of these other things, the world hopes. They hope to make it to heaven. I hope to make it there. But those are all dead hopes. But this one here is a living hope. Doesn't that make God adorable? <laughs> He's caused me to be born to a living hope. I've got a resurrected Savior from the dead. And then, as we'll see today, to obtain an inheritance. That is in verse 4. So we want to take up the reading in verse 4. And we'll just read two verses here. We'll focus on verse 4 and verse 5. Because verse 3 ended with a comma, we move right on into verse 4. And we don't arrive at punctuation indicating the end of a sentence until we get to the end of verse 5. So we'll complete this sentence, which is, it's a marvelous sentence if you read the whole thing start to finish. In fact, maybe we'll do that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that's one sentence in the Bible you can stand on there. There's all kinds of marvelous things in that sentence. So, not just to be born again, not just to a living hope as if that weren't enough, but to obtain an inheritance. Now, this phrase, obtaining an inheritance, it's, it was found elsewhere in the Bible as well. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 1 and verse 11, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance. There it is again. Obtained an inheritance. And the, the tense is present tense. That tells me it's presently mine. I have obtained it. Not I will obtain it. Granted, in all of its fullness and all of its perfection, we haven't arrived there yet. But nonetheless, it's mine. I have obtained it. Now think of this scenario, even in the world. What a good fortune it would be to be born to a wealthy father. And think of this scenario. What if there were a wealthy man and he decided to, he was childless, he decided to adopt into his family some mis, uh, um, with misfortune, an unfortunate orphan, or orphans, adopt them into his family. And not just to care for them, we would say, we would, we would applaud such a man as that, wouldn't we? Even in society, we'd say, that's a, 
That's a good man. I wish there were more men like him in the world, adopting an orphan and taking him into his family and caring for him. But what if it weren't just simply caring for him? What if he also willed his fortune to this adopted orphan? Well, that's kind of what's happened to us in Christ Jesus. We've been born into adoption, into a family in which our father is very wealthy. (laughs) And we have not just simply been cared for, our temporal needs met in this life, but we have inherited his riches in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.16 tells us the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ. So you see the flow right there. Adopted, Spirit testifies, children of God, Not just children cared for here in this life, but heirs. And not just simply heirs, but heirs with Christ Himself. That's glorious. So, to obtain an inheritance. Now, I say this with respect. We have a right to it. According to that verse that I just read. We don't ask for the inheritance. We don't purchase it. We're sure not deserving of it. But nonetheless, we have a right to it. We're born into this blessed privilege. That's what that verse said. Children, and if children, heirs. It's an estate given to us simply by right of our birth. Born into the family. Paul told the Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 2, joyously giving thanks to the Father, he said, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance in the saints of light. Qualified. Are you qualified? If you're a child of God, you're qualified. If you're not a child of God, you're not qualified. We're children. So if we're children, we're qualified for an inheritance. So that's obtaining an inheritance. Now, there are three negative descriptions here in regard to our inheritance. Don't know if you've ever noticed it or not, but they are negatives. A man that I read as I was studying this had this to say, and it explains it just a little bit better in his own words. He said, As we desire to set forth the glory, purity, and perfection of the other higher world toward which we strive, we are almost inevitably compelled to do this by the aid of negatives. You wouldn't think that, would you? by the denying to that higher order the things that are the leading features and characteristics of this one. In other words, Peter ends up saying, our inheritance, it's not like this. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's really striking that we end up describing that which is to come in using the negative terms about the world that we're living in now. It's not this way. It's not this way. It's not this way. Why is that? Because that's all we know down here. So what do I mean by that? The three negative terms indicate that in attempting to describe the heavenly inheritance, Peter could only tell us what it's not like in terms of our present life. He uses the word imperishable. It won't perish. Undefiled. That's a negative term. It won't be defiled. Undecaying. Unfading. 
negative terms. So I found that very interesting. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Everything we know here fits that. But not the one to come. Now before we go on and look at some of these um, a little bit more in depth. There's something implied in these two verses right here. that I want us to take notice of, and that is the perpetual nature of these glories yet to come. The dictionary tells me that perpetuity, that's the word for perpetual, the perpetuity of the world to come. The dictionary tells me that is the state or quality of lasting forever. It's perpetual. It's beyond certain limits. It's perpetual. Now, in this realm in which we live now, if we were to compare it to our inheritance yet to come, nothing lasts forever here. Does it? If there's anything perpetual here, it's corruption and decay and defilement, and fading. Those are the things that are perpetual here. Fading, for example. The shingles on your roof are fading. We were driving yesterday in our neighborhood, and Jenny pointed out someone who got their roof fixed after a storm, patched up. You know why? Because the new shingles they put on there were They were colorful and vibrant. The old ones faded. The clothes in your closet fade. How many times do you have to wash them? They start fading. The paint on your car, you wax your car, it fades. The jewelry on your hand, the complexion of your face, all of those things fade. The strength and beauty of youth What does the Bible say? The grass withers, the flower fades. Everything on this earth is that way. It's fading. It's corruptible. It suffers decay and defilement. But not in the land to come. It's perpetual. The amplified version of the Bible says, born anew, born again, into an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change and decay. Has that ever dawned on you before? Paul said in Romans 8.21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. That's the world around us. We even sing a song that has a phrase in it, change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changes not, abide with me. Corruption. So it's perpetual in its nature. That's, I just say that's implied right here. So let's look at some of these qualities. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. Now that tells me that if we say it's perpetual then it's perpetual in its original integrity. It'll last forever the same integrity that it had from the beginning. Our inheritance. It'll endure the passage of time perpetually without decaying. That's imperishable. It's It's as perpetual as God Himself. He said His Word endures forever. My Word will not pass away. So in its original integrity, it will last forever. In its original purity, it will last forever. The Word is undefiled there. That is, it's totally pure. Our inheritance yet to come. And it will stay that way. And it's just as pure today as it was in the day when Peter wrote it. Undefiled. 
You know, there are plenty of fortunes that are amassed by corruption and oppression. Plenty of people get rich by stealing or illegal means, things like that. And so here could be a fortune amassed and passed on to someone that was obtained by means, defiled means. But ours, not so. It's not corrupted. It's not mingled with impurities. And it's always been that way. It's totally pure. It's rightly obtained. And it's not fraudulent. It's free from any, any effect or influence that would deform it or debase it or cause it to lose its worth or its value. can't be cheapened in any way. Can't be, it can't disappoint us in any way because we arrive and, and realize that we're not inheriting what we thought we were. It's been defiled. That can't happen. Matthew Henry says, Sin and misery, the two grand defilements that, that spoil this world and mar its beauty, have no place there. It's not defiled. Back several years ago, it might even have been decades, it might even have been in the late 80s, you remember that, um, that boat called the Exxon Valdez? Some of you might remember that. You're nodding your head. There was, a, there was a, a boat carrying crude oil up by Alaska that ran aground, I guess, as the investigation proved the captain had been drinking and turned over the control of the vessel to some under, understudy, and he ran the ran it aground, the hull was torn, it was a single hull ship, and Prince William Sound, which is a pristine Alaskan shoreline, was defiled 1,600 miles of shoreline with crude oil. All the wildlife, the seals, the birds, all of that. Defiled. Pristine, beautiful, defiled. That can't happen where we're going. It's perpetually undefiled. Wayne Grudem says it contains nothing unworthy of God's full approval. It's perpetual in its original beauty. The word is un unfading. Just as brilliant as it has ever been. And the writers of the Bible, they don't know what to say to that. So they say things like streets of gold, gates of pearl, all these beautiful stones that Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem is made of and all of that. All of that apocalyptic language, what that says is, I'm trying to tell you something and I don't even know how to describe it other than in terms of natural the natural world that we live in now. And so he says streets of gold. And it's perpetual in its beauty, original beauty. The word in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but my resources tell me that word is amaranthos. If I'm saying it right, I don't even know, but I believe I am amaranthos in Greek. Amaranthos, that's the word that is used in the name of a flower called amaranth. I don't know if any of you know that. Maybe some of you that are more familiar with flowers than me know it by that name. I don't. But I looked it up because I can do that. And the internet said this, if you're looking for dried flowers, you've come to the right place. Amaranth flowers, amaranthos, same word, unfading. They're flowers that keep their color after they are dried. They make perfect dried flower arrangements. This is the advertisement pitch for this flower. That's why the ancient Greeks named this plant for the Greek word unfading. Now, Peter is using that term in Greek 
amaranth, amaranthos, to describe what's coming for us, unfading. It's perpetual in its original brilliance. Later in this letter, Peter calls it an unfading crown of glory. So our inheritance, it can never suffer variation in its value, in its glory, in its beauty. It's time-proof. What's time-proof in this world? It'll never lose its luster. It'll never grow dull or tarnish. It can't be improved by polishing it to a higher shine. Like your car. You go to sell it, what do you do? You shine that thing up. Not our inheritance, not the one that I'm going to receive anyway. Perpetual in its original beauty. It's perpetual in its original preservation. Now, I put this question. Someone might say, you know, this is all wonderful, Clint, what you're describing here. That which is to come, it's glorious, and I've got to believe it's like that. But will it be there for me when I arrive? Well, we're told in verse 5 that it is reserved. It's guarded. And we know what a reservation is. We make the reservation at a restaurant or a lodge or somewhere like that, a hotel or a resort, a reservation. And what are you doing? You're securing that for when you finally arrive whenever that might be. Well, the original language indicates it's a completed past activity and it's continuing in the present. So it was reserved in the past and it's continuing perpetually in that state, waiting for me to arrive. Reserved. God has reserved it and is still guarding it. For me, it continues to be there. Now you can imagine if it was your anniversary and you guys made a plan for your wife to go out for a dinner at a fine upscale restaurant and you made the reservations for that. And then you get there, you find that lo and behold, your table's been given to somebody else and the amount of time you have to wait for another table to open up, you can't even endure it. And so you go somewhere else to a disappointing alternative. Hopefully your wife isn't disappointed. So there was a case of a a reservation that was given away to somebody else, but that's not my inheritance. It's reserved for me. I don't have to settle for a disappointing alternative. Paul said, in the future, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, laid up for me. So this inheritance is without any vulnerability. It's totally unlike any earthly inheritance. A Christian's inheritance is enduring. I saw a bumper sticker um, one time on the back of a motor home that says we're spending our children's inheritance. Well, that won't happen here with my heavenly Father. He's guarding His children's inheritance. It's reserved. It won't be lost. It won't be ravaged by hostile forces or anything like that. Do you remember in the days of that wicked king Ahab in the Old Testament? He wanted a vineyard that was right next to his palace. Do you remember that vineyard belonged to Naboth? And he wanted that, that for a garden. He wanted to turn it into a vegetable garden. And so he approached Naboth and he said, I'll uh, sell, sell me your vineyard. I'll buy it for you or, I'll, or else I'll give you another one somewhere else, relocate you or whatever. And Naboth said, to Ahab, the Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my father's. But as the story goes, Jezebel said, don't worry about it, king. I'll get that for you. And she got some guys 
to lie about Naboth that he blasphemed, and of course the death penalty for blasphemy, they took him out and stoned him, and Nahab moved next door and got that vineyard anyway. Well, my inheritance cannot be ravaged by hostile forces like that. It'll be there for me. How much has been lost to enemy invasions? It's unthinkable that heaven could be invaded, isn't it? And our Savior dethroned and our inheritance lost? Who can mount an attack like that? Sometimes wills are successfully contested by parties not mentioned in them. Jesus had to deal with that. Two brothers came to him, and one brother said, Tell my other brother to give me the inheritance. Jesus said, Who made me a judge over you? Remember that? Sometimes people are deprived of an inheritance because of legal technicalities and things like that. So many inheritances vanish away before they're ever obtained and quickly squandered even after they are obtained, but not mine. It's perpetually there, reserved in heaven for me, guarded. It's perpetual in its personal application, he says, for you. Reserved in heaven for you. That's very personal. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's a staggering statement. For me, there's an inheritance, and it's been there from the foundation of the world in the mind and plan of God. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Here's another one, Acts 20 and verse 32. Paul said to the Uh, Ephesus elders there, I commend you to God, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. So here's this inheritance, and it's perpetual in its personal application. It's for me, forever for me, since the foundation of the world. And I'll never be disappointed in it. You know, in King Solomon's day, he, there was that guy, King Hiram, who helped Solomon in the building of his kingdom and his palace and all of that. Hiram did. And we're told in 1 Kings 9 that King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. So Hiram came out from Tyre, that's where he was from, to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they did not please him. And he said, what are these cities which you've given me, my brother? So they were called the land of Kabul until this day, and Kabul means disappointment. But it'll never be a disappointment to me, my inheritance, like it was to to Hiram from Tyre. He got cities that he wasn't pleased with. (laughs) But I'm told in Ephesians 1 that it's the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. That'll be every bit pleasing to me as I can ever imagine. Jesus told that thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. How can you be disappointed in paradise? And the personal aspect of it there, today you will be with me. It's perpetual in its personal application. Now he says in verse 5, we're protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. So again, someone might say, 
You know, Clint, I believe there's a marvelous inheritance like you've been describing it. I believe all the perpetual aspects of it that you've talked about here in these last few minutes, but how will I ever arrive there? How will I make it? It's only good for me if I make it there. What's to keep me from falling away? What's to cause me, keep me from going back and not making it? And sometimes believers might become anxious, wondering if they ever have the strength to remain faithful to the end. Maybe even you've thought that way or wondered that about yourself. I have, in all honesty. Especially if you see what you would classify as, in your mind you thought, better Christians than yourself fall away. It shakes people's faith and it makes you wonder, how am I ever going to make it? I believe all that is up there. But how do I know I'm going to arrive there? Well, we are perpetually preserved by the power of God. The ESV version says, you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. That's how that it's worded in that translation. So we're being brought through an enemy's territory by a strong escort, and we will make it if faith is real. I believe that's what that doctrine, the preservation of the saints, is all about. Those that are God's children, He makes sure they make it there. There's a reservation waiting for them. And we're preserved, Peter is saying, by the power of God, kept, protected by the power of God. By, through, and for. Those are the words that are used there in that verse. Kept by God through faith for a salvation. By, through, and for. There are forces at work all around us in the unseen realm that are working to guard us and preserve us to make certain we arrive there because we're children of God. Remember Elisha's words to his servant when they came out one morning, the fog cleared and they saw the enemy forces all around on the hillside surrounding them. They came to take Elisha into custody, Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And there's a lot going on that you can't see. And when that servant's eyes were opened, he saw all around them the chariots, horses, angels, a fire to protect them. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Jude says, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. It's like you could, if you, if, if you were of a mind, it's like you could get a tattoo that says, kept for Jesus Christ. I wouldn't recommend it. Put it on your forehead. <laughs> kept for Jesus Christ. No, of course I'm kidding there, but I'm not kidding in the reality of it. That's the believer kept for Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only way that I know, the only reason I have, that I'm going to make it. Right. Jesus prayed for me, you know. He, he prayed for you too if you're a believer of His, a child of His. We heard it not too long ago and from John 17 where Jesus was praying and He said, Holy Father, keep them in Your name. While I was with them, I was keeping them in Your name. I guarded them. Not one of them perished. And He went on to say, I do not ask You to take them out of the world, but that You keep them from the evil one. That's the Savior's prayer for you and I, His children. Keep them. Guard them. Keep them. I was keeping them. Now, You keep them. Now the word guarded, it can have two different meanings. It can mean guarded from attack, but it can also mean kept from escaping. 
right? Peter was arrested by Herod, thrown in the inner jail. He had a soldier on the right and a soldier on the left, and he had gates to go through and all of that. An angel broke him out. You can read the story there in the book of Acts. But my point is, he was guarded, kept from escaping. I'm glad to think that God is doing that with me. (laughs) He's keeping me from going back. He's keeping me from throwing it all in and saying, I've had it with this. This isn't what I signed up for. And going back to the world. And we've known many that have. So when I read these words, protected or guarded by God, it's not just guarded from an attack outwardly, but it's guarded and kept from escaping. You know, a prisoner can be handcuffed to a guard, kept from escaping. Both of the senses of the word apply right here. There's another verse that says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, kept from escaping, guarded, rescued. What about that one in 1 Corinthians 10? God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but He'll provide a way of escape so that you can bear it. Kept from escaping, going back. There are forces at work, angels, to guard us and keep us, protect us. The first chapter of Hebrews calls them ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So here I am on the road to inherit a salvation and there are angels sent to minister to me. (laughs) Kept, protected. So we're told it's through the means of an active personal faith. Confidence in God, not confidence in me. I stand on verses like these right before us today, kept by the power of God. It requires faith to lay hold of that and say, God is keeping me. He's keeping me. I believe it to be true. I'm standing on that in faith, confidence in God. I've said that in the past, that is a a simple definition of faith, confidence in God. God by His power is energizing and sustaining our personal faith by which we're shielded and restrained to the end. Do you remember Jesus said to Peter, Satan is desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. When faith fails, that's it. But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. So we're protected by the power of God through faith. That's the means. Confidence in God. We're even saved that way. By grace you're saved through faith. An act of faith. So here it is. A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So salvation, it's ready to be revealed. That tells me that it's made ready for us and this life right here is making me ready for it, I have to believe. That's part of what sanctification is, making me, preparing me, making me ready for heaven. And we're waiting for our final salvation to be revealed. The verse tells us it's coming in the last time. And that's an interesting phrase, the last time. For the believer, the last time would be death or it would be the coming of the Lord Jesus in His glory. The last time He brings salvation in all of its glory and all of its splendor and all of its full meaning, it's revealed in the last time. But for the unbeliever, there's a last time as well. For the unbeliever, there's coming a moment when it'll be the last time to take a breath on this side of eternity. There will have been a last time to hear of this salvation, a last time to lay hold of it and believe it and be saved. A last time. There'll be a last time to receive mercy. Today, the doors of mercy are wide open. Anyone who comes, in fact, we read earlier, born again according to the mercy, the great mercy 
of God, the doors of mercy are open, but there's coming a day when it'll be the last time to believe and be saved and receive mercy and secure your soul and escape the pit and bow the knee and embrace the Redeemer. So these thoughts of heaven and our inheritance and the glories to come to true believers, they're meant to be comforting. That's comforting to me, these verses right here. No matter what is going on in the world around us, and it is a very disconcerting, troubling world right now. Everywhere you look is prejudice and hatred and violence and strife. And it makes you sigh and say, Lord, how long? But these verses are comforting to me. For many people that are just um, maybe just religious people in some way, not truly children of God, these could be selfish desires they talk about and sing about in some kind of a superstitious, sentimental way. Streets of gold and mansions and gates of pearl. And you, sometimes you hear the, wor the world talking that way when Peter opens the gates of pearl to receive me and so on in some sentimental, in some sentimental way unscriptural views. To many, that's what they are. But to a true believer, these, these words are comfort. These thoughts, they ought to magnify our Savior. He purchased our pardon. They ought to glorify God who keeps us day by day. And it was all His plan, the plan of redemption from the very beginning. And it ought to glorify the Spirit who gives us a new heart, a new life, causes us to be born again, seals our adoption, the works of the Holy Spirit. These things I've been describing to you here ought to make you realize and adore God all the more. <laughs> Revelation 21 he who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That is comforting to me. And Jude closes that very brief letter that he wrote with this, these verses. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in his presence the presence of His glory, blameless and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I couldn't close with a better couple of verses than those. <laughs>